Okay, I want to welcome everybody to this uh, webinar. Uh, it's about 12 noon and uh, we're going to get going. Uh, my name is uh, Jonathan Kays. I'm an Extension Specialist with the University of Maryland Extension. And our, our set webinar today on understanding landowner liability recreational access will be for the next hour. Um, I'll be doing uh, a good bit of the program initially. And we are also fortunate to have Lieutenant Paul Hanyak Area 7 Commander with the Natural Resources Police, who will come in later, and he can um, he will be talking about uh, the issues regarding trespass. Um, so that is basically the agenda for today. The technology that we're using, if you're not familiar with it, is Adobe Connect. And on in front of you, you'll see a number of screens, which uh, may change when we go into presentation mode. But the, the attendance list on the upper left-hand side, and so far we have approximately 80 people that are registered for this uh, webinar, and we have 43 so far. Uh, you'll see my camera and voice here on the left-hand side. Uh, when we get into the program and into the presentation, what I'm going to do is to uh, freeze that, and that minimizes the bandwidth that you need and will help people with who have limited connections. Also on the, on the lower left is the, uh, is the chat screen, um, and that's the way we can communicate if you have a question or a concern. Uh, we'll do the best we can to answer, to, to deal with that. Uh, this is how we're going to deal with questions, in fact. Um, I would suggest if you have questions, they should be submitted privately, probably to Ellen Green, who is, um, and you, if you just write down her name, and uh, w when you go into the chat box and you write a question, um, it says it automatically sends it to everyone, but uh, you can just highlight that and actually pick a specific person. And if you can see down there, you can pick uh, Ellen Green, and they're listed alphabetically, and there she is. So um, uh, hopefully, I would suggest you include your email address, and since it said probably to her, she'll be the only one to get it. Uh, we'll have a couple, try to have a two Q&A sessions in the seminar, one about halfway through when I'm, I'm done with my section, as well as one at the end. And depending on the number of questions uh, submitted, you know, we may not get to them all, so we will make sure we email them to you, which is the reason, you know, we want your email. Um, today's... Um, is a, kind of the first webinar we've done through the University of Maryland Extension, and hopefully uh, we will have more to follow. Um, I would encourage you to go to our website, naturalresources.umd.edu, where you will find a lot of the programs we offer. Uh, the program that we're having today is, going, is being recorded, and uh, it will be made available in a couple days, probably uh, available on the website, so for those of who could not view it can view it then. Uh, I think that'll be a real benefit. Uh, also, we have some other things we can offer you. We have a branching out forestry newsletter on our website, uh, which goes out quarterly electronically, and that would keep you up to date on other upcoming webinars and other information related to uh, uh, forestry and wildlife management. Um, this program does carry one continuing forestry education credit for uh, professional foresters, and if you are interested in that, make sure you um, uh, you sign on with your first and last name. If you didn't do that initially, you can just go out and come back in and do that. And then send us a follow-up email after we're done, and we will um, uh, make sure you get credit for that. The publication we're using is the basis for our presentation today. It has a lot more detail. Uh, it is uh, Extension Bolton 357, Recreational Access and Landowner Liability. It's available free online from our website, and I hope that many of you had a chance to actually view, review what's in there. If you uh, will scant over a bunch of things today, but there will be more detail in there, and it's on our website in the Publications Library under the Management tab. So um, uh, I hope that... Uh, if you haven't had a chance, you can get to it later. Uh, that's where we are right now. We want to get going with the program. We have an hour. We hope to complete in that period of time. Um, before I do that, I want to ask you just a couple of questions to help us to find out who you really are, uh, who, who is, is online. And we do this by a couple of polling questions. I will open a polling question, such as you see here, what state do you live in, and just click on the state that you're from. And we'll see that people, the results are instantly um, categorized and put up there for all to see. I'll give you just a couple of minutes to uh, answer those questions. And it seems like we've slowed down. About half of our participants, uh, almost half, are from Maryland. 
Um, so that's good. 44 people. So we'll close the poll right now on that. Uh, our next question is, um, you're interested in this topic as what? Uh, and you can answer all these that apply. A hunter, a recreationalist, uh, all those things that are listed. So just check all the ones that may apply to you. And you can see the results being instantly tabulated. Um, it's kind of interesting to see how this all comes across. And I'm sure there are many people that are woodland owners and hunters or hunters and don't necessarily own a, a lot of woodland. So that's good. All 44 people uh, have responded, and, and that's great. Or 31, anyway. Okay. Many are other, so I'm not sure uh, <laughs> what that means. But um, So anyway, we'll move on to the next question. If you are a landowner, how many acres of land do you own? If you could just I guess that's just one thing. And fill that in. So So I just ask you to kind of we want to move along, get to the program. So just answer all those questions if you would. We only have 21 out of 43 answering. That seems to be all that we're going to get at this point. So thank you very much for that. And our last question is, how do you find out about this webinar? Um, if you could just indicate the main way that you found out about this. You only have one choice here. And it seems like most people uh, have responded to that at this point, and that's good. So we have an audience that's uh, largely from Maryland, but a number of folks from Pennsylvania, uh, a mixed in terms of their interest. Uh, many uh, larger landowners, in fact, which is very interesting, people from 51 to 71 acres. And uh, most people found out about this through email, which is, which is great. Okay, with that, I'm going to move on to the presentation part of the program and get right into our um, into our PowerPoint here. Some of the things we're going to talk about today is about recreation. Obviously, there's all kinds of recreational access, whether for uh, boating, or for ATV, for fishing, um, for uh, hiking, uh, for trail riding, whether horses and things like that, as well as, of course, hunting, which is a big concern here. Um, Deer uh, are a big problem these days, and many landowners are trying to find ways to attract hunters onto their property and are very concerned about their liability. And that's one issue we certainly want to address today to make landowners feel more comfortable about what their liability is for people on their property. And for recreationalists who are interested in talking with landowners to make them clarify really what the law does say about that issue. Um, under recreational access that we're going to discuss today, we're also going to talk about cutting firewood because, believe it or not, cutting firewood is defined as um, as uh, a activity for um, in terms of recreation. So, um, a couple of the commonly frequently asked questions we hope to address today: What are my rights, and how do I exercise them to control the recreational use of my property? What's the extent of my liability to recreationalists, and how can I protect myself against liability suits? What are my options for posting my land and controlling trespass and recreationalists? And uh, Lieutenant Hanyak will be addressing that mostly later. And how do I charge for recreational access and still provide uh, liability protection? And um, we'll see how much time we have left to deal with that issue. And also, a little bit about timber trespass. Hopefully, I'll make a few comments about that. Those things that we don't cover, um, well, obviously, everything is covered well in the, in the publication. Well, first of all, I have to make a disclaimer. Um, I'm not a lawyer or an insurance professional. I'm a professional forester, and uh, this has been a big concern. So I've done the research necessary, I think, to, and had it reviewed by the Attorney General and others. To, to have a, a credible publication here, but again, this is, presentation is not intended to be a substitute for professional counsel. But we are talking about liability here, and liability is kind of used in a couple of different ways. 
Um, one way is the perception by people is that, well, I'm liable for anybody who comes on my property, and the perception is that, boy, I can be sued and lose everything if somebody gets hurt. The reality is, as we'll find, is really not that. Uh, there's very few uh, under the recreational statute that we're going to talk about provides a lot of protection to forest to, to landowners in general uh, for people recreating for no fee on their property. So, um, uh, and finally, you know, liability can be used as an excuse. And that means if I just don't want someone to come on my property, um, then I don't have to, uh, uh, I just say, well, I don't want you on my property. So that, those are a couple things to consider. So let's get into the meat of this matter here and, uh, and talk a little bit. First of all, the general rules of liability uh, descend from English law, and they're based on two, two, two things, the visitor's status and the duty of care owed to that visitor. So the three types of visitor status are trespasser, licensee, and invitee. And for each of those, a different duty of care is owned. So in terms of the liability for someone on your property, you have to know their status. Well, if you're an invitee, that's kind of like a business relationship. That's a person specifically invited by you, to, and, they're, they're, and you're benefiting as an owner from that person being on the property. You're being paid, typically. And this, obviously, is where the highest duty of care is owed. And uh, you have the duty to seek out, discover, correct, and prevent dangerous conditions or activities, or to warn uh, invitees um, if they cannot be corrected. And this is a business relationship, and you it's a high duty of care, the highest duty of care owed. The next one is a licensee. And this is where a person has the owner's permission to be on the land to further their own purposes with no particular benefit for the owner. And this would be a case, for example, I invite Joe, my friend Joe, to come over and go hunting. He's not paying me anything or giving me anything, but I'm, you know, uh, under strict laws of liability, I owe him a higher duty of care because I have the duty to warn, but not to correct those hazards. And the owner, but the owner has no duty to inspect the premises. So not quite as stringent as being an invitee. Finally, if a person is a trespasser, uh, that's a person who enters or remains on the property without the permission of the owner. And in this case, the landowner owes little or no duty to seek out, discover, or correct unsafe conditions. So you can see kind of this creates a problem because the status of the visitor and the duty of the care can change in each situation. And the liability status can be uncertain. So this creates little incentive for landowners to allow recreationalists to enter on their property. So the recreational statute in Maryland, and they're found in each state, is finding a legal way to encourage owners of land to make their land and water and airspace available to the public for recreational and educational purposes by limiting the landowner's liability towards the person that's coming on the property or using the land or water or airspace. Um, that's the purpose of a recreational statute, to encourage, encourage private landowners to take away this, this, this uh, uh, nebulous idea of what they're liable for and what's the status of the visitor. And um, these recreational statutes were developed in the 50s, but really got going in 1965 when the Council of State Governments uh, developed the 1965 Model Act. And what it really said is that it allowed the use of the property, of private property, or basically landowners that people could use uh, the property for recreational purposes, and it limited their liability, the owner's liability, as long as there was no charge. Now, there were some improvements made to this in 1979, but uh, the point here is that every state has adopted some aspects of these recreational statutes, but they vary from one state to the other. So that's what you've got to be clear. What applies in Maryland, there's some nuances and changes in other states that could be critical that you need to understand. Um, but they all basically came from the same 1965 Model Act. And what it really does is it says that all visitors coming on the property for recreation are considered trespassers. And if you remember, that was the, uh, the visitor status that had the lowest duty of care. It only applies if no fee is charged, 
and it covers the entire range of recreational and educational activities. So all these things I see here, these would all be covered. Um, and in the Annotated Code of Maryland, where this is specified, and these are all provided in the publication, it, it lists recreational purpose as everything you can pretty much imagine. Um, all these things, hunting and fishing, uh, pleasure riding, uh, hot air ballooning, <laughs> um, viewing historical or archaeological sites. So water skiing. But it also says that, and this has kind of been accepted, that even if the recreational activity is not specifically mentioned, the courts have acknowledged them as recreational. So, for example, things like mountain biking and caving and GPS uh, geocaching and things like this that are, you know, new recreational activities come along, and even though they're not specifically mentioned in statute, uh, they, 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 are, they are covered for the most part. So... Um, so all our recreational um, activities are covered. What about educational purposes? You know, this is a concern for some people. You know, I want to have a tour in my property, but what if somebody gets hurt? Well, it clarifies that all these educational purposes also come under the recreational statute, so that nature study, farm visits, you know, judging of, of livestock for like 4-H or uh, agriculture activities. Um, historical and archaeological activities and things like that. So um, these are all listed. Um, uh, now one of the critical points here is that we're saying that as long as it's a re recreational or educational activity, um, that it's come under the recreational statute. As long as there's no charge, you know, you have limited liability and we'll explain that liability thing in a minute. But the question comes up, what is a charge? Well, a charge is a fee or a price asked for services or entertainment, you know, recreation performed, or, or products. Um, so in return for invitation or permission to enter and go on the land. Well, this kind of creates a gray area, or it has in the past for a lot of landowners, because, well, I let these guys hunt, but uh, they, um, um, uh, in return, they, they they fixed some roads or fences for me or done some work on the farm or the property. Is that considered a charge? And it was about the year 2000 in Maryland, our statute was amended. So it basically says the charge does not include the sharing of game, fish, or other products of recreation, benefits to or arising from the recreational use, or contributions in kind or services to promote the management or conservation of resources on the land. This third one is a really biggie because what this says is that, for example, people coming in, you have a group of hunters or recreationalists that fix some fences or do some work for you on the property that contributes, and it's fairly broad, obviously, promotes the management or conservation of resources on the land. That's a fairly broad window. That is not considered a charge. So um, if you're a recreationalist looking for a place to hunt or to recreate, any type of recreation activity, making landowners aware of, of what the law says about these things can be very beneficial and, and put people at ease. Well, what about liability? Um, uh, it clarifies this issue of liability uh, in the statute or in the annotated code. The owner of land who directly or indirectly invites or permits without charge persons to use the property for any recreational or educational purpose or to cut firewood. So it's a little humorous that, you know, cutting firewood for personal use is considered recreation. So uh, by doing this action, they do not extend any insurances that the premises are safe for any purpose. They don't confer upon the person the legal status of an invitee or a licensee. And if you remember, that was that higher standard of a, a higher duty of care. And they don't assume responsibility for or incur liability as a result of any injury to the person or property caused by an act of omission of the, of the person or persons. So this is a, you know, a fairly broad protection. Um, and in terms of what is a safe premises, the code says this, that an owner of land owes no duty to keep the premises safe for entry or use by others for any recreational or educational use to give a warning of a dangerous condition, use, or structure, 
or activity on the premises to a person who enters on the land. So, you know, you, you really you have no duty to keep the premises safe or to warn anybody about a danger. So um, that should be comforting to a lot of people. Now, does this mean that you're never liable? Well, you can never give up your total liability under the recreational statute. Uh, it does not limit in any way any liability which otherwise exists for willful or malicious failure to guard against you know, a dangerous condition. And um, well, malicious is probably obvious to most people. I mean, that's behavior purposely intended to harm. You know, this is when you're shooting people. Uh, you know, you're uh, 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 you know intentionally trying to harm somebody. You know, trip wires, things like that. Obviously, that's a criminal. You're, it's a criminal act, really. You're trying to harm somebody. You know, you're not going to be protected under the recreational statute for that. Uh, Willful is kind of falls between malicious and carelessness, but uh, malicious again is a hard thing, relatively hard thing to prove. And this would be the case where, you know, when you had a particularly dangerous condition that would have been discovered with only minimal inspection, perhaps. Uh, but the fact is that again, it's 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 a fairly high standard to prove in a court of law. You and the, the burden of proof is on the person pressing the charges. So. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll build on that just in a few minutes. Um, one other question that comes up about the recreational statute is where does it apply? Now, most people would think and look at something like this and say, you know, uh, well, you know, you can see the pointer here, rural land like this, it certainly would apply. But a recent course by the Maryland Circuit Court of Appeals, a case in 2002, found that it also applies on many of these more urban or suburban properties. Uh, it reaffirmed the recreational statute and confirmed that it applies to some of these more urban areas. And, and the case in particular is described in, the, in, the, in a lot more detail in the publication. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it here, but the course, it, it, just kind of an overview, it had to do with the Greenbelt Marriott Hotel from a case in 1998 where a fellow was staying there at the hotel. He was a runner. It was in the winter. And he asked the hotel if they had a, a running trail. And they said there was a trail next door on some business property. And they, he went over there and, um, and uh, fell and hurt himself and tried to sue the hotel as well as the management company that owned the adjacent property. And you can look at the more particulars, but the point is that the court said, well, you know, there was no fee involved, and they owed no duty to keep the premises safe, and uh, basically, they were excluded under the recreational statute. So, um, and again, if you look at the photo here, this is a picture of A is where the Marriott Hotel is in Greenbelt, and for anyone from Maryland, you know, Greenbelt is not exactly, you know, Green Acres, so, uh, you know, it's right in, the, right in the middle of things, so... Um, that's very encouraging. Uh, just a point of how many cases are out there where recreational litigation has taken place. And I put this in as an additional slide from a publication I found that looked at recreational injuries since 1965. Um, injuries or death to recreational users since 1965. And it had it for all 50 states. Um, now, this only applies to cases that proceeded through trial and reached an appeals court, not to those that were settled out of court. But the only thing I really want you to look at is look at the, look at the case of Maryland, um, and you will see that in terms of the number of cases against public agencies that went through trial and to circuit court uh, was zero. These are all zeros. Uh, the number of cases against private landowners, zero. Um, the number of cases holding private landowners liable, zero. And so again, now that's not the case in other states. And I think that's partly a reflection of the good liability protection provided by the Maryland Recreational Statute. So um, I just point that out that people who think that there's this whole bunch of case law out there of all these people being sued all over the place for, uh, for all these types of things um, doesn't necessarily, um, uh, doesn't, doesn't necessarily hold up. So um, just to, uh, something to cater. Somebody had asked about if this covers a company as well as a landowner. Um, and I, I, I would have to say it probably does, again, if it, a company is a private landowner. Um, so um, that would be, that would, I think it does. Uh, 
So I pulled this out of the publication just to make the point that there is not a, the case law that's out there does not seem to support the fact that uh, people are winning these judgments over and over in different uh, liability cases. Well, what does someone have to do to prove um, to press a lawsuit, you know, the recreationalist has to prove that the landowner had actual knowledge of, of, of the danger, and that's opposed to constructive knowledge, which means, you know, they should have known. So they have to prove they actually knew of the dangerous condition. The landowner realized the possibility of the recreationalist encountering it, and the landowner willfully maliciously failed to eliminate or reduce the hazard. So this is a fairly difficult thing to prove, which probably explains why there's not a lot of this case law out there. Well, nobody wants to see other people get hurt. So I think the point to remember here is the way to reduce your liability as a landowner is to practice risk management. And all that really means is that if you have hazards on the property, remove them or post them. You know, make it clear to people coming on the property that they're there. That would avoid any problem in the future. Uh, if people are coming on the property, you know, uh, request to let them know where these things are and, uh, you know, indicate to them. Many people have landowners or recreationalists sign a signed release. Most lawyers indicate that's not of a lot of great value, but it does indicate that at least that if in there that they were made aware of, of hazard, potential hazards and things like that. It does give you a little more credibility if there were a, ca a court case. So uh, the other thing to consider is that while you may not have a judgment found against you, people can always sue. So the reason you need insurance is to pay for legal defense against real and frivolous suits, as well as if there happened to be a judgment awarded by a court insurance. Uh, so insurance gives you peace of mind. So you need to have adequate insurance for the things that are happening on your property. So the point is that make sure your insurance provider knows what activities are taking place on your property, so they're not surprised if there's a problem. Um, uh, that's an important thing. And most conventional farm policies, now if you are charging for hunting, again, that's a business relationship. So uh, you're an invitee. Um, so you have a higher duty of care. And if you, most farm policies do not cover fee hunting where you are actually receiving payment. That's an add-on policy. There are specialty companies as well out there that are listed in our in our publication. Um, so make sure that uh, you, you know don't don't be well. I have insurance, but that's not going to cover you know fee hunting type relationships or fee fishing type things. And the other thing is, if you have a number of different parcels of property, make sure that your insurance coverage is on all those parcels. Some people buy different parcels of property, and they never put the extended the insurance to the other parcels. That could be very bad if there was some type of problem. So check with your insurance agent on those things. And in our publication, this is listed as uh, some of the other associations and some of the specialty companies that provide uh, hunting liability insurance um, for hunt clubs as well as for other types of recreation. And uh, you can ask your own insurer, but uh, in most cases with these policies, what you want is you want to be the landowner and the recreationalist are with the same on the same policy. And that usually eliminates a lot of problems. And uh, there's more information on that in our book, but uh, in, in, in the publication. But um, it's best not to have, you know, the landowner have an insurance company and then the recreationalists have a policy with a different company. That just kind of can create problems down the road. So good working relationships are necessary between recreationalists and landowners. Uh, many landowners have had bad experience with, with hunters and other people on their property, which is many times why they don't want them on the property. And I've received a lot of requests from landowners trying to expend a lot of effort to keep trespassers off their land. And they're, and they're usually frustrated because you can never many times do that. And my question to them is what the question you should be asking is, what, who do I want on my property? So if you find a responsible group of uh, local hunters, uh, uh, recreationalists of a, another sort, and you can work with these individuals and you find they're credible and honest and respect your rights, many cases, because it is so difficult to find a good place to 
to hunt and, and do other types of recreation. If you give them the right to do under, that on your property, many times they're going to take care of those trespass problems for you because they don't like other people coming on, quote, unquote, their property, you know, that they're allowed to use. So a strategy worth considering. Uh, a couple of questions before we move on that are uh, commonly asked. Um, can I be sued for obvious natural hazards such as a hunter trips over a rock uh, or a falls down a steep slope and is injured. And most of the courts typically find that natural hazards are really not uh, not covered under most of those things. I mean, there's an expectation out there that, uh, you know, <laughs> you have to expect that there's a, you're going to be able to take care of yourself in that respect. Um, that's not going to be a dangerous condition, per se. Um, Suppose there's a hazard on my property, such as an abandoned well or fallen and barn, that a recreationalist or someone on the educational field uh, field trip might encounter. How can I protect myself about someone getting hurt and suing me? Well, again, this is risk management. First of all, you can't stop anybody from suing you, but for them to pursue it, they actually have to have some evidence. Um, but again, the best thing is risk management. If you have some known problems or dangerous conditions, either remove them, post them, fence them off, or at the very least make people aware of them. And uh, that should uh, take care of a lot of your responsibility. I have a serious damage to field crops and forest land from deer. I want to allow hunters on my property. How do I find good hunters and protect myself from liability? Well, that's a big question. Um, uh, usually, most of the time, spent in finding a good group of hunters is at the upfront time. You know, either you advertise in the paper, uh, you put out some local ads, you interview people, make clear what your expectations are, meet with a few of them personally, ask them for references, okay? You'd be surprised what people will tell you on the phone, but it's not true. And uh, follow up with those, with those references. Once you find a good group of people, then you can work with them and uh, after that, uh, that's, the, that's, that's the easy part after that. Um, you can look at, you know, charging for fee hunting. Uh, one, one strategy as well is to have a written lease, even though you, there's no money changing hands, just so people know what their respective responsibilities are uh, with regards to the use of the property. Several hunters were hunting on the landowner's property, and one accidentally shot another. Can the landowner be found liable? Again, they would have to prove that, you know, you knew of this danger and that, uh, uh, and it's, you know, very difficult to prove uh, unless, you know, you're purposely putting people in harm's way um, uh, as a landowner. Some sportsmen and clubs claim to have their own insurance that will provide coverage in case someone is hurt. Will this relieve the landowner of liability? Remember, you can never relieve yourself totally of liability. You just reduce the liability, in this case, to willful malicious damage. Um, so... With coverage, uh, usually it's best to have a policy with the hunter and the landowner on the same policy. Uh, I would not take people's word for it. You need proof of insurance, but even that, you know, insurance policies can be canceled. Um, I would encourage you to um, either uh, work with them to make sure that you're on the same policy uh, in, in one way or another, um, and uh, rather than take it for chance. <laughs> I see that. Uh, if an accident occurs in which I'm liable, won't my liability insurance rates skyrocket? From my understanding, that's typically not because they're co compensation type policies and uh, typically they're not, uh, they don't skyrocket like that. But uh, I don't claim to be an insurance, that would certainly be a question to ask your ins insurance agent. Um, so um, uh, that's um, pretty much um, my part of the program here. And um, I don't know if we had any other, I think I had a few questions that were addressed, um, if others come up. That's my portion of the program at this point. Uh, with, we had a few questions that tried to answer them. At this point, um, I'm going to put my video on pause again, and we're, Lieutenant Paul Hanyak is going to take over and talk about trespass and property rights, and we'll have some time for questions and answers with him as well. So um, if you would just give us a minute to make the switch over. Good afternoon. My name is Paul Hanyok. I'm a lieutenant with the Maryland Natural Resources Police. I'm the Area 7 Commander, and that area is Frederick and Washington Counties. 
and I'm here to talk to you about trespass and landowner property rights. Maryland law re reinforces the rights of landowners to control access to their property. However, some type of written notice um, must be given, or verbal notice, or the property must be posted conspicu conspicuously against trespassing. Landowners can um, exclude all recreational use on the property, or they can allow everyone to use it for recreation purposes, ex except for those activities such as hunting, ATV use, and fishing. Noted here um, are the sites in the Maryland law that state these rights. One way for tr landowners to exclude access to their property um, is to post it in a conspicuous manner. Um, the laws have stated that a conspicuous manner would be posting it approximately every feet, every 50 feet. As you can see the, um, from the slide that the penalty for this is uh, 90 days, up to 90 days in jail or a $500 fine or both and it is a misdemeanor. Posting can be done in two ways. Use of bright blue paint applied to trees or post. Um, there are certain requirements though. Um, the, the mark, if you're, if you're using um, um, bright blue paint, must be at least two inches in width and eight inches in length and three to six feet above the um, land or water. Um, it should be applied um, no more than 50 feet in order to be conspicuously posted. The other option is to post signs no more than 50 feet apart that say no trespass. Other signs can be used, such as that state things such as hunting by written permission only or permission only, or permission may be granted. However, in order to go, get a successful prosecution in the court, the words no trespassing must be noted on the sign. Another way to prevent unwanted individuals from using your property is to um, give verbal notification. However, the notification must be proved in court. Um, it would be good if you're going to ask someone to leave your property and not come back to have a witness available or to follow up that verbal um, notification with a certified letter. The penalty for this is the same as for trespassing on posted property. It should be noted that a person can enter or cross your property or board your boat in most cases without your permission. A verbal notification is necessary if you want them to lead. This does not apply to entering houses or outbuildings or cabins on board your boat. In general, a person could walk across your front yard or through your backyard to enter another area. However, they cannot look through your windows of, of, of uh, any building or your residence or enter it. Once the individual is told to leave, they must do so or they're subject to arrest by a police officer. It's simply, um, it's simply that the landowner has to ask the person to leave and not come back. And if they don't leave or if they do come back, um, the landowner should uh, contact the local police or the natural resources police to resolve the matter. If a landowner has stocked his pond, his probably own pond, and has given written public notice in, in areas um, that are local to the pond against trespassing, an individual may not trespass in order to fish the pond. ATV use on private property is a form of recreation where permission is needed. The user must have this written permission on their person to assist police officers in their enforcement efforts. The same thing holds true um, with ATV use on public property. Um, written permission is needed. Hunting is another form of recreation where written, where written permission is needed. It should be noted that the hunter would be would um, be liable for any damage he or she does to the property and the landowner would not be liable for any accidental injury or damage. Unlike ATV use, the law doesn't require the permission to be with the hunter, however, having with them assist in law enforcement of this law. After posting your property, it would be a good idea to seek um, speak with adjoining landowners, local conservation clubs, and the like to further state your wishes. If all else fails, contact the Natural Resources Police. 
you can ask the recreationist to leave. Um, however, if you do that and um, they leave before the police get there, uh, it would not be a good case um, because the violation has to occur in the presence of view of the officer. Because a violation is a misdemeanor, it must be um, it must occur in the officer's presence or view. Um, also, the landowner it's necessary for the landowner to appear in court to state a couple things: one, that they own the property, and two, that the the violator or the defendant was not allowed on the property and was told to do so either by posting or written or or verbal notification. There are other posting options. Um, you can leave the property unposted. Um, <clears throat> however, the landowner um, liability is usually no greater on the unposted property as on the posted property. But it must be remembered that recreationalists have no legal um, requirement to request permission. However, hunters, off-road vehicle users, and uh, fishermen on privately owned ponds must have that permission. One of the most common questions I get is this. ATVs commonly use my property, but when I try to approach them, they just leave before I ever get close. They have caused extensive erosion on my roads and trails, and the noise is annoying. They act like they own the place. What can I do to keep them off the property? I suggest to work with the adjoining landowners and neighbors to find out who the trespassers are, and to post your property and reinforce fencing and gates. Another question is I am an absentee landowner and I know people in the area hunt and ride vehicles on my property when I'm gone. There's also been some vandalism at my cabin. What can I do to keep people off my property or control the trespassers? A suggestion here may be to allow a hunting club to use your property and to look after it or hire a caretaker. You can give notice to NRP and local police departments of your concerns and they can patrol your property accordingly. Another question is a number of friends and people who I allow to hunt the property want to place a target shoot. I usually tell them to use the meadow, but I am concerned about the possibility of bullets hitting homes that are being built in surrounding areas. Should I just not allow target shooting? I would definitely continue to allow target shooting. However, it must be done in a safe, safe fashion and on the use of a proper backstop. There is a Maryland law against reckless endangerment, and that just basically says that any type of this uh, activity, this recreational activity, cannot create a substantial risk or death or injury to another person. In this case, as far as target practice, it must be done safely, and the best way to do this is to, to um, um, build a proper backstop so the projectile does not go past the backstop into surrounding areas, and to make sure that uh, the individuals that you allow to target practice on your property use that backstop. Another question I get is, can a police officer issue citations for trespass or only officers of the Maryland Natural Resources Police? Any police officer can um, issue a citation for crimes that um, have a maximum penalty of $500 um, and or 90 days in, in court. Um, and because these violations that I specify as far as trespassing meet that criteria, a natural resources police or any police officer can issue those citations. However, the violation must appear and occur in the presence or view of the officer. Um, I've just been handed uh, five different questions that I'd like to answer. Um, the first one um, is from a person named John, and how about horse riders? Uh, the same thing applies to horseback riding as, as hunters um, I, um, and other recreationists. Um, you need the permission of the landowner. Um, <clears throat> correction, you don't need the permission of the landowner, but if the property is posted against trespassing, you have to abide by that, or if you've been getting verbal or written notice. You do not have to have written permission um, to horseback ride on someone's property. Another question that was handed to me is, what is the best way to deal with a landowner who violates a law, specifically the Maryland street law? I, I don't know the answer to that question. Another question is, what about crossing one's property repeatedly, um, thus creating a path? Again, unless the landowner comes out and gives verbal written notice or the property is um, posted conspicuously against the trespass, it can still be done. If there's damage to the property, um, there may be a civil case. 
And lastly, um, will a video suffice if an officer is absent during violation? Um, again, um, it has to appear in the presence of view of the officer. However, the uh, video would suffice as far as some evidence uh, for prosecution in court. Those are all the questions. Okay, that's all the questions I have, and um, at this time we'll, we'll pause. Hello, this is uh, Jonathan Kayes back again. Um, appreciate um, Lieutenant Hanyak being here to uh, you know, answer some of those questions regarding uh, trespass and, and other issues like that. Um, I have a, uh, uh, had another question um, that came to me from a James Carroll, um, and I'd like to answer regarding the stuff I talked about. If I ask a hunter to pay a portion of a hunting liability insurance policy, is this considered a fee? Um, and I guess the question is why the person's paying paying for the hunting liability policy. I I don't see how that would be. Uh, what what a couple of people. First of all, is if if you are going to charge for fee hunting access, you know you're going to need uh, liability insurance. And many people through lease arrangements have the uh, the hunt club pay for that. But they also are paying, you know, some per acre charge or something for hunting and things like that. So uh, there's a number of things involved in that. Um, sometimes, even though many, you know, hunting and other activities are protected, you know, and included under recreational statute, people still feel the need to want to have a hunting, you know, liability policy from people hunting on their property. And and while that's fine, um, I'm not sure that would be considered a fee. I think you're just uh, but again, I will check on that, and we can uh, we can follow up to make sure that's make that's make sure that's correct. So, uh, I'm not sure if we have any other questions regarding the other things that we have talked about. Um, but uh, since we have a couple of minutes, um, I will just take a a couple of minutes to talk about uh, timber trespass as well, uh, which uh, can be a problem. And again, I'm going to freeze my video here. Uh, timber trespass is where someone intentionally comes onto your property and uh, uh, intentionally or unintentionally and, and, and timber is, is taken. Now, uh, timber can be worth a lot, a lot of money, but the law is pretty clear in Maryland regarding timber trespass. Uh, and what it says if, basically is if someone cuts your trees without your permission for any reason, and the actual statute or the annotated code is provided in the publication, you are due triple the value of the timber of the cut that may be recovered. Um, the only thing I would mention here is that you have to typically, uh, haven't seen a number of these cases take place, the best thing you can do is really to try to work out an arrangement. In many cases, timber harvesters, you know, the property lines may not have been properly marked, and it was somewhat of an honest mistake. Uh, the best thing to do is if you know the trees have been cut on your property for uh, without your permission, is to try and work with the harvester and try and work out arrangement. Many times they're more than willing to do that. They realize they may have made a mistake. Uh, you are due triple the value of the timber, uh, and perhaps you'll negotiate for that or for something less. But if you do go to court, realize you're going to have to prove your case. So it behoove you when you find out about it to take a lot of pictures and and things like that uh, with regard to how they the access and the damage, and realize you're probably going to have to hire a professional forester to testify in court. There's going to be, you know, frustration and other things that take place. Uh, and many times, depending on the value of the timber that was cut, uh, you could have a lot of that cost eaten up in, in lawyers' fees and other things. So it's always good to try and negotiate some of those things, unless it's just a, you know it's a total outright uh, you know thievery of some sort or another. But the law does give that, makes it very clear that you are due triple triple the value of the timber. And, of course, the value of the timber has to be assessed by a, a forestry professional. Uh, ways to uh, stop timber trespass or control it in many cases are simple things just like, uh, you know, gating your, gating your act property, uh, very clearly marking your boundaries, you know. Uh, many, just because there's a stone wall there or a line of trees there doesn't mean that's the actual... Um, uh, that that is the actual border or the actual boundary. So, having a current survey is always a good thing. If you're going to be um, having timber harvested on your property, make sure that you know exactly where your property lines are to avoid that problem with somebody else. 
Um, so just a couple of things to consider. There's some other suggestions given in the publication. Um, a couple of them are listed here. Um, also, the other idea is when you sell timber, many times it's best to use a private professional forester to, to deal with that when selling the timber and uh, to cooperate with your neighbors so you know that you know, many times uh, how people are gaining access to the property, that neighbors would know that if people were coming in who shouldn't be there. Um, if you are interested in the services of a, a private consultant forester, uh, a list of those licensed professional foresters can be found on our website at www.naturalresources.umd.edu. Um, just a couple other things. Uh, we don't have a lot of time really to talk about lease hunting per se. Um, we have in our publication a number of sample leases and I think like I said earlier, um, in many cases even though you may not actually charge for someone to hunt on your property, if you have an arrangement with a group of hunters, it's not an idea to have a, a lease, a, a, a hunting lease which clearly indicates the uh, uh, the responsibilities of all those that are involved, and if you have a problem, it's very clear what's to be done. The biggest thing about um, about about fee hunting um, is that um, is the insurance aspect of it, and uh, uh, and but there's also income that can be derived from it. We did a uh, in our publication we have this table. I just did a rough survey of extension agents uh, around the, around our state to get an idea of what people were charging uh, for uh, hunters for some different types of wildlife, and for a lot of the deer and turkey hunting leases, they ranged anywhere from eighty to thirty dollars an acre. So for people to finding a way to basically derive some extra income, um, as well as to perhaps uh, get rid of some deer on their property in many cases because there's a lot of deer. Um, that can be a possibility. You can see that uh, income from uh, geese is all over the place, but it can be, if you have a larger farm, it can be fairly substantial. If you have an interest in this, uh, feel free to please you know, give, you know, give me a call. Um, we can talk about that more, more directly. Um, but realize that, you know, that there are a lot of benefits that come from this, uh, reduction in vandalism, tr trespass control, um, Many times hunt clubs will make some investments if you at least to a group of hunters, um, improved wildlife management, and you can exercise other things like quality deer management and other types of management strategies, and some just basically improved profitability. It's, it's an extra source of income to pay, to pay your taxes and things like that. So um, uh, that's about... Uh, about that, just to realize that fee hunting is not covered under most farm and home, homeowner policies, requires special, requires special coverage, and we have a list of some of those uh, policy uh, sources. Many of your associations will actually give you some good deals, like the Maryland Forest Association and the Forest Landowners Association, both offer policies to their members, and that can be a very good deal. So, uh, and uh, one other thing just to realize with regards to leases, um, and you can look at all the sample leases that we have, but in most cases, most hunt clubs or groups of hunters or recreationalists are not incorporated. So if you do develop a lease with a group of hunters, you're probably going to have a contact person, but you'll want all those people that are going to be hunting on the property to sign that lease, and that lease needs to be notarized. So, and since it's not incorporated, you know, that one contact person cannot sign for, say, a, them as a corporation. Um, so each person, in order for them to be held accountable, if there's a trouble, they need to be to notarize their name, have their name notarized on that lease, and that's clarified in the publication as well. So uh, this was a list I showed earlier, and it's listed in the publication of various specialty insurance policies that are that are out there. And again, I would encourage you to get our extension bulletin 357 and uh, find that information. Uh, there's a lot of information there that, that I think you can use. Um, if there's, uh, and again, I would encourage you as well to go to our website and subscribe to Branching Out, our Forest Stewardship Newsletter. Uh, if you are interested in wanting us to subscribe you, we will be happy to put your email uh, and you will be, uh, get a free notification for that. Uh, we had a couple of other uh, questions that just came in, and I'm going to... Um, uh, Visitor status question. 
if a tract of land is owned by a homeowner association, are they considered the landowner? I would think they are because they're you know incorporated and such, so that the, they're still a, a private landowner entity. Yeah, I would believe so. So um, I'm not sure if we have any other questions. Um, that's a, that's about it. Um, right, what, I, what I'd like to do is my contact information is listed here. If there is uh, some way that I could help you, especially if some people are interested in fee hunting arrangements, more than willing to do that. Um, we uh, uh, again, a lot of material is in our publication. But before we end, um, again, uh, I'd like to just indulge you, please, to ask you a couple of questions about, you know, what you what you may have learned from this uh, from this webinar. Uh, this is the first webinar, like I said, I've done, and I appreciate your patience with some of our glitches. Uh, but the first question is this. Uh, if you had a chance to look at the publication, the usefulness of the publication, Extension Bolton 367, to me, was very useful, somewhat useful, not useful, so on and so forth. So, um, or if it just confuses you, that's, uh, you can let us know that, too. <laughs> All right. And I'll just give people a few minutes to... Um, to respond. Um, they leaving? Okay. That means most people probably have not seen the publication, which means you probably need to, to download that and make a copy. Our next question is, my understanding of land over liability issues has been greatly somewhat improved, not affected, or you're more confused. So. And again, we'll give you a minute or two. Just two more questions after this, and uh, it'll be about 1 o'clock, and we should be right on time. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you very much for responding to that. Um, finally, uh, I want to ask you this question. Um, I plan to do the following as a result of looking at this, uh, this webinar. Allow more use of my property by recreationalists. Uh, lease my property for hunting, use paint marks or signs to mark my boundaries, use the information, you can check as many of these as you wish, use the information to educate landowners to let me use their property for recreation, deal with the trespass problem, or practice risk management. So I just listed some possible actions. Uh, always helps us to know um, what types of things you might do with this information. And again, it looks like a number of folks have responded. Okay. And one more question here. Um, thank you. My understanding of um, how to control the use of my property is greatly improved, somewhat improved, not affected, or more confused. Okay. And I think, you know, on behalf of myself uh, and Lieutenant Paul Hanyak and uh, my assistant Ellen Green, we thank you for attending today. We plan on doing some other seminars on some other topics. And uh, if you'll please uh, note our website at naturalresources.umd.edu. Uh, I encourage you to subscribe to our branching out newsletter, and then at least you'll get electronic notification.